The problem I'm discussing in these lectures is the nature of autobiographical writing by Jews over the century, over the centuries, and specifically the way in which such writings can legitimately be used as sources for Jewish history. Uh, now that the nature of autobiographical memory uh, has been studied both by literary critics and by neuroscientists, both of whom agree that we can no longer take autobi autobiographies as uh, totally reflective or as simply reflective of historical truth, given the vagaries of memory and the literary demands uh, which are imposed upon a writer unconsciously when one sits down to select which memories to record, which to select, which to omit, and which uh, memories and how memories are shaped when one makes the decision to commit one's life story to writing for posterity. Last time I spoke about two uh, 17th century Jews, Asher of Reichshofen and Glickel of Hamlin. And tonight I want to talk about two modern Russian Jews, uh, but two modern Russian Jews so different from, from one another than, uh, that I'd ha I'll have to explain why I'm including them in one lecture. The first is Moshe Leib Lilienblum, who was one of the most famous Hebrew writers of the 19th century, one of the most famous writers of the Hebrew Enlightenment movement, who became an early leader of the Love of Zion movement in late 19th century Russia, and hence is a hero of Zionist history. There is barely a small city, not to speak of a large city in Israel, which does not have a street named after Moshe Leib Lilienblum. The second person I want to talk about is Osip Mandelstam, who is one of the most renowned Russian poets of all time, uh, who was profoundly ambivalent about his Jewishness and in fact underwent a formal conversion to Protestantism at the age of 20. Before justifying a comparison between these two so different and yet to me so intriguingly similar autobiographical Jews, let me step back to note that in the 152 years between the death of Glickel of Hamlin in uh, 1724 and the publication of the first volume of Lillian Bloom's autobiography in 1876, there was an explosion of Jewish autobiographical writing in both Western and Eastern Europe, something that hadn't happened at all for the long centuries of the Jewish past. A small number of these autobiographies were written by traditional Jews, but there's no doubt that there is an obvious, if intricate, link between the appearance of so much autobiographical writing among European Jews and the newfound centrality of autobiographical writing in Enlightenment Europe and the newfound centrality of the individual in Enlightenment thought. Indeed, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Confessions, which were first published in 1782, marked a turning point in the history of autobiographical writing as profound as that of St. Augustine about a millennium and a half earlier. The first and most studied Enlightenment Jewish autobiography was that of Solomon Maimon, who was a quixotic and sort of unruly Polish Jew who made his way to Berlin uh, at the end of the 18th century and then to the forefront of the German philosophical world. His Lebensgeschichte, or his life history, which was written in German and first published in 1796, was clearly modeled on Rousseau's autobiography as well as other contemporary German life stories. Soon after its publication, this Jewish autobiography attained great popularity among German readers, making a, a distinct impression on Goethe and Schiller, and later on George Eliot. More relevant here, it served as the principal model for almost all subsequent German Jewish, Yiddish, and Hebrew autobiographies written in the Enlightenment period. Thus, the first Enlightenment Hebrew autobiography, Mordechai Aaron Ginsberg's book called Avi Ezer, which was written in the late 1820s, was obviously influenced by Maimon and by Rousseau in its graphic depiction of the problems of Jewish childhood and adolescence in Eastern Europe. His overarching theme, the overarching theme of this autobiography, was the inescapable impotence, literal and metaphoric, of men reared in traditional Jewish homes. That, Ginsburg claimed, denied the boys the right to be children rather than shorter versions of adult males, that forced them into early marriage before they were sexually mature, that feminized them and masculinized their wives. And in general, he claimed, these, uh, this child rearing uh, denied 
and reject nature in the name of a primitive view of God's desires. As the first post-Rousseauian Hebrew autobiographer, the first modern Hebrew autobiographer we know of, Ginsburg visibly struggled to, struggled to convey his first-person intimate experiences in the Hebrew language, and his prose is not surprisingly stilted and at times unintentionally hilarious to modern readers, especially when he twists biblical locu locutions to convey sexual experiences not easily reproducible in a language he only knew from sacred tomes. But what's most relevant here, as with Usher of Reichhofen's earlier descriptions, which I talked about last time about his sexual desires, is the shifting and culturally specific boundary between the private and the public, uh, a subject that has been much studied in regard to Western Europe and American societies, but which we're only studying, which we're only uh, beginning to understand about Jewish society in the 19th century. In Yiddish and Hebrew before the 19th century, as well as German and Russian for that matter, there is no precise equivalent to the English word privacy. But actually, the English word privacy before the 19th century largely meant being withdrawn from the society of others or from public interest, seclusion. It's only from the beginning of the 19th century that privacy begins to mean, even in English, what we take it to mean, that is, freedom from interference or intrusion, freedom from other people's prying into our intimate lives. Now, there is no such concept, there is no such word in Yiddish and Hebrew or German uh, or Russian until the 20th century. And one of the most subtle corollaries of the modernization of European Jews then was the gradual and largely unconscious acceptance on the part of Jews of these new Western European norms of the appropriate demarcation between the public and the private, between what you talk about in private and what you talk about in public or what you write about in private and write about in public. Even uh, the, uh, the Yiddish women's Bible, the Tzenarena, uh, which was read for centuries and published for centuries uh, for Eastern European Jewish women, we have been told, was progressively more and more censored in the course of the 19th century along Victorian lines, gradually but crucially diminishing the open discussion of sex and sexuality in its pages. That is, uh, pre-19th century Yiddish Bible for women had a lot of discussion, a lot more discussion about sexuality than in the 19th century was this, when this was deemed to be inappropriate for public discussion. So this first Hebrew autobiography still partakes of the traditional pre-Victorian norms of the boundaries between the private and the public, which would soon be rejected in Yiddish and Hebrew autobiographies uh, since uh, as the scholar David Beale has aptly put it, these biographies tend to hide eroticism or neutralize eroticism in the name of the new virtues of romantic love and the chaste bourgeois family. A major motif that crosses all forms of 19th century Hebrew and Yiddish literature then becomes the enlightened young man who escapes from his sexually unattractive wife forced upon him in early marriage seeking greater freedom and openness away from home, but not to the extent of having sexual relations outside marriage. The most extended and extensive example of this is none other than my first autobiographer tonight, Moshe Leib Lilienblum, who was born in 1843 and died in 1910. His autobiography, entitled Chatot Nurim, The Sins of My Youth, was first published in 1876. It's a deadly serious autobiography by a man barely 23 years old, written in often gripping Hebrew and presented to its readers as constructed almost entirely out of citation from his own diary and letters, tied together with only brief retroactive comments. It's clear that the reader is meant to believe that Lillian Bloom has barely interceded into his narrative. And the same is true of the third and last volume of The Sins of My Youth, which is called The Road of Repentance, or in Hebrew, Derech Tshuva, which was written in the early eight, and mid-1890s. Now, the autobiography as a whole is dedicated to a woman identified only by her initials, F.N., 
that we know to have been a woman named Fega Nevachovic, a single woman with whom Lillian Bloom fell in love while he was still a married man in the Lithuanian town of Vilkomer, and with whom he carried on a correspondence for many years. Indeed, much of the drama of the first volumes of his autobiography revolve, uh, revolves around this tragic romance. Our hero married off at the unconscionable age of 15 to a woman he barely knew and who was uh, by no means, means his intellectual or spiritual equal. Finally meets the love of his life, Fega, in his last few months in Vilkomir, when he is pursued with great zeal by Orthodox Jews because he has begun to doubt his faith and to seek enlightenment. Only Fega understands him and gives him solace, but he is forced to abandon her as well as his wife and children as he escapes south to Odessa to pursue the possibility of secular education. There in Odessa, he suffers from poverty, loneliness, and an all but total inability to function in the modern world, all of which were caused, he continuously insists, by his father's rearing him in the backward traditions of East European Jewry. For more than a century after its publication, Hebrew readers and highly sophisticated literary historians took Lillian Bloom's stirring autobiographical prose to heart as auto unproblematically reflect reflective of his life as it was lived. Only in the late 1970s and 1980s did this naive reading of Lillian Bloom began to change as the uh, notions of literary critics uh, about the lack of truth-telling in autobiographies began to influence the study of Hebrew literature. Thus, several scholars wrote excellent studies of Lillian Bloom's work, analyzing its literary nature and its retrospective and ideolo ideological construction of self. The Israeli literary scholar Ben Ami Feingold, for example, compared some of the citations of the correspondence and diary entries in Lillian Bloom's Sin of My Youth with the original letters and diary entries, which are held at the National and University Library in Jerusalem, and noted how the former differed from the latter. And he questioned the authenticity of much of the alleged documentary material included by Lillian Bloom uh, in his autobiography, especially the letters he claimed to have been written to his wife. But no one has noticed that in The Sins of My Youth, Lillian Bloom also hid from his readers salient information about his relationship with that Fagan Nevachovish that is included in the small part of his diary that has been preserved. If you want to publish your autobiography, don't keep your diary. And from in which in extracts not included in the autobiography were published already in 1927. Thus, we see in the diary not only that the correspondence between Lillian Bloom and Fagan Nevachovich continued long after he tells us it ended, but that contrary to what he said in the autobiography, he actually met her face to face in an extremely emotionally charged encounter when he and his family fred, fled from Edessa back to Vilkomer during the Russo-Turkish War of 1877. In the autobiography, he referred to this trip only with the following words. From my diary, part two. On the 28th of April, 1877, I traveled with my family from Odessa and arrived with them in Vilkomir on the 2nd of May. There I stayed about a month since my three children came down with measles, and after they recovered, I traveled to Kovna. On the 2nd of June, I left Vilkomir again for Kovna, left there early in the morning of the 8th of June, and arrived in Odessa two days later. The editor of the scholarly edition of this autobiography, which was published in 1970 in Jerusalem, tells us in a footnote that the manuscript, the original manuscript of the autobiography, contains the following text that was then erased by Lillian Bloom himself. Some readers, Lillian Bloom wrote, and especially female readers, will doubtless ask me, did you see the young woman, Anne, when you were in Vilcomer, and what did you say to her? The answer to this question will only be known if the young lady ever herself ever writes her own autobiography and deals with this matter. But the same editor, usually scrupulous about alluding to diary entries not included in the published version, doesn't reveal what a simple glance at the diary extracts that we have shows, that the entry for this date reads as follows. On the 28th of April, 1877, I left Odessa with my family, and on the 2nd of May, I arrived in Vilkomer. On the very same day, I saw Fagan Nevachovich, whom I thought I would never see again for the rest of my life. On the 8th, she criticized me with strong condemnations, and then the rest of the sentence was crossed out in another ink. 
But the entry continues. On the 10th of May, I cried my eyes out with her. On the 23rd of May, I wrote her a letter from Kedan. On the 24th of May, I cried my eyes out again. On the 28th of May, again, the sentence is crossed out in another ink. Followed by, on June 2nd, I parted from her again with the rest of the sentence crossed out in another ink. On the 6th of June, I wrote to her from Kovna. On the 10th of June, I returned to Odessa and wrote her again. On the 17th of June, I started studying for a gymnasium. And on the 18th of June, I wrote to her again. On the 22nd of June, I received a letter from her and, I, and answered her on the 25th, and so on and so forth. In other words, what we have in the autobiography proper is not merely a selective presentation of diary materials on Lillian Bloom's part and a highly self-aware literary manipulation of this relationship, but a complex, almost entirely conscious and purposeful misrepresentation of the facts of that relationship filtered through at least five layers of authorial obfuscation. First, the transition from reality to the diary. Second, William Bloom's later censoring of the diary itself, clearly to hide embarrassing material. Third, his partial selection of diary entries in the original manuscript of the autobiography, withholding the information about his meeting with Fega and their later correspondence. Fourth, his titillation of his audience's curiosity about whether the two ever met. And fifth, his decision to omit this titillation from the published version of the autobiography. So how, one may legitimately ask, can we move back from this quintuple masking of the truth to truth itself. Moreover, of course, we only have Lillian Bloom's side of the story, not Fega Nevachovich's. Her only words, her only preserved words, are the ending of a letter that, that she wrote on May the 3rd, 1895, that is 18 years after the last traces of their correspondence in his diary. She wrote, my dear Moshe Leib, please write to me again, but everything in more detail, which will delight me, your true, unending bosom friend. Alas, all we know from her brother, the famous early Jewish socialist, Morris Vinchevsky, is that she died unmarried and alone in Vilkomir, still pining, it seems, for the love of her life, Moshe Leib Lilienblum. A similar dissonance between the facts of Lilienblum's life and his autobiographical description pertains to another aspect of his personal life, which he pretended Rousseau-like fully to be revealing to us. While to be sure he continually harps on his unhappy marriage, he deliberately and continually mutes mention of his children, to the extent that it's hard for the reader even to follow how many children the Lillian Blooms have and how many survived the, the uh, ravages of the 19th century, that is, of infant mortality. At one point, well into the narrative, we learn that he had a four-year-old daughter. We are not even told her name. And she is only summoned to make an obvious ideological point about how the Jews nonsensically believe that the world was created especially for them. A few pages later, we are surprised to uh, read that at this point, which is 1863, he already had three living children, as you heard in the thing about measles, but one who died. Information one would have thought essential to a commitment to total disclosure. But here, this information is only revealed to emphasize his own incapacity to live life as an autonomous adult, itself, of course, caused by his own father's commitment to the uh, errant traditions of East European Jewish child rearing. Indeed, since the overall theme of the first two volumes of, uh, of Lillian Bloom's autobiography was his progressive loss of faith in God and in traditional Judaism, the silence about the death of this child is quite remarkable. But seven years later, in 1870, another one of Lillian Bloom's children dies, a fact we learn about not at the time that it occurs, but several months later in a letter written to none other than Fagan Nevachovich, in which he writes, much thanks from the depths of my heart for your condolences on the death of my son. You will, of course, understand that I do not any longer ascribe such events to God, but I truly do not know why this loss didn't make as much of, did not make as much of an impression on me as it ought to have, perhaps because my heart is so wounded it cannot be moved by any tragedy. But what is so strange and important about these and similar passages is that they blatantly contradict the evidence about his profound love 
for his children in the diary fragment still extant, but not chosen by Lillian Blum to be included in his autobiography. Thus, in the diary, we hear consistent laments about how terribly difficult it was for him to leave his children when he departed for Odessa, how often he pined for his children while he was there, and most especially, how the death of his son David shattered his universe. Let me cite only a small part of the long, wrenching lament he wrote in his diary after his son David died on the 28th of September, 1870. I received a letter from my wife that tore my heart asunder and killed it, a letter that darkened the skies and the earth of my universe and left me utterly broken. This letter brought me the bad news that my most beloved son David died. My son, my son, who will bring me close to you? Who will take you out of your grave for a moment so that I can kiss you for the last time? My son, my son, I run through the house like a madman, back and forth, my face awash in tears that I can barely wipe from all my pores but which no one sees. Come here, my son, my son, come to me. I'll take you in my arms and pour my boiling tears on you, for you are my dear son, my favorite. Oh, my poor son, you can no longer come to your sad father who always carried you in my arms and sang songs to you. My churning tears pouring forth on your untimely death fall to the ground, trodden over by my feet. My son, my son, your eyes were closed. The grave swallowed you up. Earth covered you. My, my eyes are no longer turned from you, but are led by their tears all the way back to cursed Vilcomer to water the grass on your desolate tomb. My son, farewell, my son. Sleep in peace. The wound will never heal. I will never forget you. Your eternal monument will be my broken heart, wounded forever. Now, how can we reconcile the contrast between this searing lament and the stone-heartedness that he claimed about this death in his autobiography? Just as we cannot really reconstruct the objective truth of his relationship with Fagin Nevachovich. What is intriguing and crucial here is not only that Lillian Bloom's autobiography, like all autobiographies, was partial and self-selected, but that he used the conceit of total disclosure, the mask of total disclosure, to veil his intimate life from his readers while brilliantly manipulating our perception that he was doing precisely the opposite. And the purpose of this misrepresentation, I argue, was neither psychological nor solely literary, but ideological. As Lillian Bloom himself often stated, the point of his writing his autobiography was didactic, to teach his readers not to follow his errant ways, to raise their children differently than the terrible ways in which he had been raised. Thus, his self-fashioning, his selection of which memories and which documents to include and which not to include, which to misrepresent, was determined by their utility, their utility to his ideology, but then his ideology changed from dedication to the Enlightenment to Zionism. Thus, in the first two volumes, his overriding goal was to fashion himself as a true Enlightenment hero, a victim of his benighted society and upbringing, who sacrificed all, and especially true love, on the altar of reason and self-improvement. He had to present himself, therefore, not only as a victim of his upbringing, but even more importantly, as a broken man, unyielding to the temptations of flesh, or for that matter, too emotionally shattered even to be perturbed by the death of his children. The tragic romance with Nevachovitch was foregrounded and fictionalized in the first two volumes because it was central to his ideological position. In Hebrew, the title of the autobiography, Chatot Nurim, is a rabbinic euphemism for masturbation. And thus, the lack of consummation of his relationship with Fega served Lillian Bloom as an extended metaphor for his pathetic and unproductive life as a whole. By the time the third volume of Lillian Bloom's autobiography was written, however, in the early and mid 1890s, he had come to reject his Enlightenment beliefs. And so the autobiographical presentation had to conform to and impose upon the facts an entirely different trajectory. And so we learn that after years of attempting to learn enough Russian, German, Greek, Latin, and math to enter university, our hero's dreams are shattered by the pogroms of 1881. 
But these, these lead him to the solution to his woes and to those of the Jewish people as a whole, which of course was Zionism. In this alternative account, Fagan Nevachovich is all but forgotten as he discovers first radical Russian thought and then Zionism. Romantic love is dismissed as but one of the effective disorders of the naive enlightenment, replaced by the most effective remedy of them all, love of Zion. And so we are not really surprised when, in the third volume of the autobiography, another one of Lillian Bloom's children, his daughter Rosalie, dies. And the tragedy evokes only the following response. On the 14th of July, 1880, my wife returned to Odessa. How my heart has turned to stone. Even the death of my daughter Rosalia on the 27th of March did not cause me to shed even one tear. On the other hand, when he hears the reports of the pogroms raging through Ukraine in 1881, his stony heart is shattered and dissipates into utter despair. The narrative ascribed in the diary entries for April 10th, or, or the supposed diary entries from April 10th to early May 1881 is unbearably tense. The violence is nearing. The news is horrific. What horrors will follow? Finally, May 7th. It's good that I have suffered. The pogrom mongers came close to the house in which I live. The women shrieked loudly and held their infants tight in their arms, not knowing where to flee. The men stood around astounded. We all thought that in a few moments all our efforts would be for naught. But thank God the pogrom mongers passed us by and fled out of, the, out of fear for the soldiers, and nothing bad happened to us. It is good that I have suffered. At least once in my life, I've been able to feel what our forefathers felt all their lives, for their whole lives were filled with fear and violence, and why should I not feel that horrible feeling that they felt all their lives? For I am their son, their sufferings are dear to me. How uplifted is my spirit now, for I came to know and feel the sufferings of my people in their exile. It's good that I have suffered. Tovli kiuneti, it's good that I have suffered. The citation, of course, is from Psalm 119 originally uttered in a radically different context. The Lord is my portion, I have resolved to keep your words. Your teaching is my delight. It's good for me that I have suffered so that I might learn your laws. But in accord with Lillian Bloom's newfound ideology, his repentance is not to the Lord or to the Torah, but to their displacement, to Jewish nationalism, far more radical than that of the superseded enlightenment. Now, unfortunately, the latter portions of Lillian Bloom's diary have not been preserved. So I can't check the text of the third volume against the actual diary entries as I did for uh, the first parts. My suspicion, of course, is that, as with his romance with Nevachovich and his supposed reactions to the death of his children, what we have here is not the contemporary documentary record it claims neutrally to reproduce, but a highly ideological, retroactive fictionalization. As one of the eminent critics of uh, autobiography put it, autobiography is an interplay, a collusion between past and present. Its significance is indeed more the revelation of the present moment than the recovery of the past. Thus, whereas many others have confidently read Lillian Bloom's text, as the most telling contemporary example of the reaction of Russian Jews to the pogroms of 1881, I can't do so, for it, there is a good possibility that he retroactively changed his account or made up his account of the events of 1881-82 for clearly ideological reasons. Be that as it may, one must be struck by the sharp contrast between his impassioned expression of vicarious suffering in the aftermath of communal attack and the almost complete absence of any actual suffering in response to the death of three children, the last one only months before. In sum, for Lillian Bloom, the mask of autobiographical truth-telling served only, if brilliantly, to hide his private self in the name of an ideologically based public self-presentation. Now, Ossip Mandelstam's autobiographical mask was even more elusive than Lillian Bloom's, and not only because his autobiography, which was entitled in its original Russian, Shum Vremini, The Noise of Time, is rhetorically a far more difficult text than Lillian Bloom's. But before analyzing Mandelstam's autobiography, let me briefly explain my admittedly unusual combination of the two figures in one lecture. They seem on the surface to be worlds apart, 
but first their chronological and geographical congruity. Lillian Bloom was born in 1843 and died in 1910, and thus he was still alive for the first 21 years of Ossip Mandelstam's life. Mandelstam was born in 1891 and died in a Stalinist gulag in 1938. Even more intriguingly, they hailed from surprisingly close backgrounds. Lillian Bloom was born in Kedani, Lithuania, a small town in central Lithuania, barely 60 miles from Vilna, where Mandelstam's mother was born, and just a little farther in the other direction from Zagori, the northern Lithuanian town where Mandelstam's family was from, despite the fact that people have thought that, uh, that they came from Latvia. As we have seen, Lillian Bloom moved from Kedan first to nearby Vilkomir, where he was married, and then to Odessa. While Mandelstam's parents were married in nearby Dvinsk, and moved first to Warsaw, where Osip was born, and then to Petersburg, where he was raised. In other words, Mandelstam's parents were not only of the exact same background as, as, uh, and generation as Moshe Leib Lillian Blooms, but they, and especially Mandelstam's father, struggled at almost the same time, if with different results, with the same pushes and pulls of Lithuanian Orthodox Judaism, the Enlightenment challenges to that tradition, and the subsequent benefits of costs of Russification and entry into the middle classes. Indeed, more thematically, both Lillian Bloom's and Mandelstam's lives were determined by their struggles with their fathers, each of whom was a perfect representative of successive generations of Russian Jewish fathers in the mid-19th to the mid-20th centuries as they moved from traditionalism to modernity. As I said, stylistically, Mandelstam's autobiography is far removed from, uh, from Lillian Bloom's. The Noise of Time is a series of 14 short, exquisitely crafted, highly self-conscious liter uh, literary vignettes about Mandelstam's childhood, written in a brilliant Russian prose at once delicate and fiercely combative, and I argue, mockingly ironic. It deals only with its subject from the age of three to 14 or so, that is, not only before he became an adult, but before he became a poet. We hear nothing about his crucial stays abroad in Paris and in Germany, nothing about his relatively meaningless uh, conversion to Christianity, nothing about his university years, nothing about his affair with the great poet Marina Tsvetaeva, nothing about his first years as a poet, about his crucial friendship with the other great female po po poet of early 20th century Russia, Anna Akhmatova, nothing about the revolution, nothing about his marriage to his later justly famous wife, Nadezhda. For good reason, the scholarship on this autobiography, which the ru one Russian literary critic called one of the three or four most significant books of our times, has been almost totally mesmerized by the power of Mandelstam's bewitching prose and by its acceptance, uh, by the acceptance of this autobiography is a factual account of Mandelstam's childhood and adolescence on the part of the ultimate authority on Osip Mandelstam's uh, life and work, his widow Nadezhda Mandelstam, who in her own wonderful and justly famous memoirs regarded everything her husband, her martyred husband wrote, including his autobiography, as sacred writ. I read The Noise of Time in a totally different way, as a sardonic, and in some measure highly parodic and highly fictionalized autobiography infused with outrageously deliberate and increasingly risky political incorrectness in 1923. Indeed, even the troubled and tortuous meditations on what Mandelstam called the chaos of Judaism of his childhood must be read, I think, first as a self-consciously literary self-fashioning rather than as an accurate reflection of truth, but it also must be understood against the backdrop of the very context in which it was written. First, the political and cultural history of the early years of the Soviet regime. Second, the Mandelstam family and its internal dynamics. And finally, the century-long engagement of Russian Jews, and specifically upper middle class Russian Jews like the Mandelstams, with the Russian language, Russian culture, and invariably with Christianity. Now, I don't have the time here to go all into all of these complex issues, which I will do in the book version. To make an exceedingly complicated uh, story short, 
the literature on Mandelstam's relationship to Judaism and to Jewishness can be divided into four tendencies. The first and the most popular sees him moving from an early hatred and disgust for his Jewish roots and family, as expressed in this autobiography, to a more positive engagement with Judaism and Jewishness in a work called The Fourth Prose, which was written in 1929, but not published until 1955, first in New York and only in Russia in 1988. One scholar has even argued that by the end of his life, Mandelstam consciously and successfully became a, quote, poet Jew, writing re-Judaized poetry. In sharp contrast, there is a view of Mandelstam as simply and irretrievably a self-hating Jew. As the entry in the Encyclopedia Judaica put it most trenchantly, both Mandelstam's verse and his poetry, I think they meant his verse and his prose, demonstrate a painfully neurotic, self-hating awareness of his Jewish roots. Close to this line, but taking a different tack, is the interpretation of Mandelstam as a devout Christian poet an exponent of authentic Russian and Russian Orthodox spirituality. Indeed, the journal of the Russian Orthodox Student Movement of Paris sponsored a survey on this issue. And guess what? They returned a size surprising unanimity in favor of viewing Mandelstam as a pious Christian poet. Finally, there is the rather shallow uh, school of thought, heavily influenced by Nadezhda Mandelstam herself, which regards Mandelstam as rejecting any limiting ethnic or religious affiliations. As Robert Alter wrote in All of All Places, Commentary Magazine in 1974, let us keep ultimate distinctions clear. Also, Mandelstam did not believe either in Judaism or in Christianity. He believed in poetry. What all these commentators share, I think, is an overemphasis on Osip Mandelstam's beliefs about Judaism and Jewishness. In the Russian context, Jewishness was always as much an ethnic designation as a religious one. And this was incalculably so, uh, more so in the Soviet period. More subtly, like so many Jews in his days, not to speak of ours, his attitude to Jewishness was not primarily religious or ideological, but an incohate mixture of love and hatred, pride, reactions to anti-Semitism, and perhaps most importantly, family relationships. In his case, particularly his relationship with his father, which changed significantly over the years and for the better. Thus, on all levels, to pigeonhole this complex uh, attitude towards Jewishness into any prescriptive or, or any other kind of classification is fundamentally to misrepresent what was from Osip Mandelstam and millions of other modern Jews so extraordinarily tangled a web at the very core of his being. Listen to one small text, the first time we hear about what he calls the chaos of Judaism. All the elegant mirage of Petersburg was merely a dream, a brilliant covering thrown over the abyss, while around there sprawled the chaos of Judaism, not a motherland, not a home, not a hearth, but precisely a chaos, the unknown womb world whence I had issued, which I feared, about which I made vague conjectures and fled, always fled. The chaos of Judaism showed through all the chinks of the stone-clad Petersburg apartment, in the thread of ruin, in the cap hanging in the room of the guests from the provinces, in the spiky script of the unread books of the Bible, thrown into the dust one shelf lower than Goethe and Schiller, in the shreds of the black and yellow ritual. The chaos of Judaism as the unknown gloomy womb from which he had issued, but which he always fled, fled, just juxtaposed against the ruddy Russian hard stone he vastly preferred. I'm not aware of any psychoanalytically informed analysis of this jarring image, but the text continues into one that we can, a, lot, a lot of us can relate to. When I was taken to Riga, to my Riga grandparents, I resisted and I nearly cried. It seemed to me that I was being taken to the native country of my father's incomprehensible philosophy. The artillery of bandboxes, baskets with padlocks, and all the chubby family baggage started upon his jury, a journey. The winter things were salted with coarse grains of naphthalin. The armchairs stood about like white horses in their stable blankets of slipcovers. The trip itself was alarming. 
at night along the way in Dorpat, some sort of farine returning from a large song fest would, would storm the dimly lit carriage with their loud Estonian songs. They would stamp their feet and throw themselves against the door. We got to Riga. My grandfather, a blue-eyed old man in a yarmulke, which covered, ha covered half his forehead, and with the serious and rather dignified features to be seen in very respected Jews, would smile, rejoice, and try to be affectionate, but he wasn't really able to. His dense eyebrows would tighten together. He wanted to take me into his arms, but I almost burst into tears. My sweet grandmother, with her black wig over gray hairs and a yellow house dress, and a house dress with yellowish little flowers, walked with tiny steps over the creaking floor and kept wanting to feed somebody. She kept asking, have you eaten, have you eaten, the only Russian words she knew. But I didn't like the spicy old people's treats with their bitter almond taste. My parents went off to the city. My somber grandfather and sad, bustling grandmother tried to distract me with conversation and ruffled their, ruffled their feathers like old, offended birds. I tried to explain that I wanted to go to mama, but they didn't understand. Then I showed them what I meant by putting my index and little finger and middle fingers uh, through the motions of walking on the table. Suddenly, my grandfather took out of the dresser a black and yellow silk cloth, put it around my shoulders, and made me repeat after him words composed of unknown sounds. But dissatisfied with my babbling, he was disappointed, shaking his disapproving head. I felt stifled, afraid. I don't remember how my mother arrived to save me. This wonderful scene. We can almost smell the almond cookies, the naphthalin, the old talus has been quoted by many critics, not only as factual, as a factual event in the life of Osip Mandelstam, but also highly indicative of his visceral rejection of Judaism. But these critics rarely realize that this is a brilliant variation on the set piece of generational estrangement found in countless Jewish autobiographies in Eastern and Western Europe, North America, and then in Israel. Or perhaps more importantly, that that paragraph is immediately followed by the following. My father often spoke of my grandfather's honesty as of, some, as of some lofty spiritual quality. For a Jew, honesty is wisdom and almost holiness itself. The farther one went back among the generation of these stern, blue-eyed, old Mandelstam men, the more honesty and sternness one found. Our forefather Benjamin once said, I'm closing down the store. I need no more money. He had exactly enough to last him to the last day of his life, till the day of his death, and did not leave even a kopeck behind. I submit that one can only read these words against the specific background of the, of the time they were written. The first years of the so-called new economic policy, Lenin's NEP time, which permitted small-time private uh, trade to be reestablished after the horrible years of war communism but still derided the often Jewish so-called nep men as capitalist exploiters, only a rung beneath the contemptible kulaks. Particularly vicious in their attacks on these retrograde forces were the Jewish communists, members of the Yevsexia, the Jewish sections of the Communist Party, who established special brigades of workers to work in the towns of the Pale of Settlement to bring revolution to the Jewish street. A major part of their propaganda work was venomous characterization of traditional Jewish small businessmen as blood-sucking capitalists, part of the rabbinic Zionist bourgeois conspiracy to exploit the hard-working, toiling masses of Yiddish-speaking proletarians. In the sharpest possible contrast, Mandelstam's description of the innate honesty and integrity of these blue-eyed Jewish men is more than striking. It was I would argue, deliberately provocative against the Soviet regime, even more so than his far more pro-Soviet contemporary uh, colleague, Isaac Babel, uh, in st stories uh, such as Gadali, and uh, Mandelstam hated uh, Babel as a result. Now, this does not mean that Mandelstam was positively inclined towards Judaism or Jews, as other critics have claimed he became late in his life seizing on tidbits of his prose and poetry that are much less straightforward than the ones I have cited. Rather, at one and the same time, he could express total but sometimes tender alienation 
from the world of tradition, which he visited only occasionally. Bitter sarcasm about what he reviled as the preposterous, preposterously pretentious Jewish upper middle classes in which he grew up, and especially contemptuous hatred for the newest version of the fawning Jew, the official Soviet-sanctioned Jewish Bolshevik. Now, all this becomes clear in an extraordinary passage on the bookcase in his parents' home. In the drab surroundings of this mercantile room, there was a little glass front bookcase behind a curtain of green taffeta. It's about this bookcase that I want to speak now, he says. The bookcase of an early childhood is a man's companion for life. The arrangements of its shelves, the choice of books, the colors of the spines offer him the color, height, and arrangement of the world itself. There was nothing haphazard in the way that strange little library had been deposited like a geological bed over several decades. The paternal and maternal elements in it were not mixed, but existed separately. And a cross-section of the strata showed the history of the spiritual efforts of the entire family, as well as the inoculation of it with alien blood. I always remember the lowest shelf as chaotic. The books were not standing upright, side by side, but lay like ruins. Reddish, five-volume works with ragged covers. A Russian history of the Jews written in the clumsy, shy language of a Russian-speaking Talmudist. This was the Judaic chaos thrown into the dust. This was the level to which my Hebrew grammar book, which I never mastered, quickly fell. In a fit of national contrition, my parents even tried hiring a real Jewish teacher for me. He came from his merchant street and taught without taking off his cap, which made me feel awkward. His correct Russian sounded false. The Hebrew primer was illustrated with pictures which showed one and the same little boy wearing a visored cap and with a melancholy adult face in all sorts of situations with a cat, a book, a pail, a watering can. I saw nothing of myself in that boy and with all my being revolted against the book and the subject. There was one striking thing about this teacher though, although it sounded unnatural the feeling of Jewish national pride. He talked about the Jews as the French governesses talked about Hugo and Napoleon. But I knew that his pride was hidden when he went out onto the street, and therefore I did not believe him. Now this astonishing paragraph has been badly misinterpreted, I think, in the literature on Mandelstam. And not only because the standard editions misidentify the author of that Russian language uh, history of the Jews as Ilya Orshansky, the first Russian language historian of the Jews, if only in one volume, and not Jewish himself. The real life author, as if it matters, was Heinrich Gretz, the famous German Jewish historian whose best-selling history of the Jews was translated into Russian already in 1900. Far more importantly, the Judea chaos is here defiantly not the culture of his home, of his parents' home, but the dustbin into which his upper middle class Jewish family thrust the authentic Judaism which they rejected. Here, if you bear with me, the precise language Mandelstam used uh, is extremely crucial to note. He used the obscure Russian word Yudeisky, not the typical word Yevreisky for Jewish, uh, for this chaos. Literally, Yudeisky is translatable into English as Judaic or even Judean. But it's even more a euphemism about Jews than the word Hebrew in 19th century Anglo-American uh, parlance, like the Young Men's Hebrew Association, the YMHA, or the uh, Union of American Hebrew Congregations. Both in his poetry and in his prose, Mandelstam used the standard words yevrei, or the adjective yevreiski, in an essentially negative way as connoting present day and especially Sovietized Jews, whom, as I said, he despised. On the other hand, Yudei and its adjectival form, Yudeiski, conjure up in Mandelstam's uh, poetry either authentic Jews like his grandparents or Judeans of the ancient past. That is, in his own cultural classification, Yudeistva, that is, ancient Judaism and its practitioners, Yudei, 
were on a substantially higher plane than Yevrei, than Jews, typically sp spoken about. Not coincidentally, the term Yevrei, which appeared in his own passport as a sign of his own ineradicable identity. Thus, the frequently argued case that in his later work, The Fourth Prose, he moved from an earlier negative attitude towards Jews, as in the autobiography, to a positive one, as embodied particularly in his statement that writerdom, as it has developed in Europe and above all in Russia, is incompatible with the honorable title of Jew, of which I am proud, is fundamentally wrong, as that is not what he wrote, which was the honorable title of Yudei, of which I am proud. So too in his absolutely stunning poetry. Here I can only cite one of his poems, a lament on the death of his mother in 1916, which I'll translate leaving the word Yudei, this obscure word for Judean in the original. This night cannot be undone, but it's still day where you are. At Jerusalem's gates, a black sun rises, a yellow sun is stranger, hush my baby, hush. In the bright temple of the Yudei, they buried my mother. Without grace, without a priesthood, in the bright temple of the Yudei, they prayed over her remains. And over mother there rang the voices of the Israelites. And I awoke in my cradle, lit by the glow of a black sun. As we have already seen, Mandelstam always used yellow and black color images to evoke Judaism. You remember the strange yellow and black Tullus that his grandfather wrapped him in in his autobiography. Here the Christian image of the black sun is sharply contrasted with a stranger or even more estranged yellow sun. But in any event, what concerns us here is, is, that, it's not Yev, Jew, is that it's not Jews, that is Yevrei, who preside over his mother's funeral, as this poem is usually translated, but Yudei, representatives of true Judaism. And so we return for the last time to the autobiography. After the chapter on the Judaic chaos, that is almost exactly halfway th through the text, the Jewish sub-theme sub of the autobiography as a whole is almost entirely dropped, replaced by somewhat nostalgic recollections of concert he heard, of his fancy school, of miscellaneous family friends, and two rather astonishing chapters on his youthful political engagement which chronicle his movement away from Marxism to the anti-Bolshevik socialist revolutionary movement, and then, though unspoken, to poetry. This is precisely, and I think deliberately, the opposite trajectory that the Soviet authorities wanted, had expected from him in this autobiography, which they actually commissioned. And it contained much overt and hence dangerously anti-Soviet material. Just barely could one get away with such overt anti-Bolshevism in 1925 or 1928 when it was republished. Only a few years later, a brief parody of Stalin himself would lead to Mandelstam's first arrest and sentence to exile and then ultimately to his death in a Stalinist prison camp. It's only one of the last tragedies of Osip Mandelstam's life then that the prison records of the Far Eastern Gulag, where he died in 1938 at the age of 47, but looking 75, defined him by the three lapsed identities he described with such creatively passionate fictionalization in his autobiography. It, his prison record said, Osip Emilievich Mandelstam, Yevrei, son of a merchant and former member of the Socialist Revolutionary Party. And it's tragic to uh, to say that I'm not sure that he ever belonged to the Socialist Revolutionary Party. It was just one of the things he wrote about in this highly fictionalized autobiography, but it in some measure led to his death. In the end, then, a tentative conclusion. I don't think it's credible to maintain for a moment that Moshe Leib Lillian Blum and Osip Mandelstam, just like Usher of Reichshofen and Glickel of Hamelin before them, I don't think it's, it's credible to maintain that they fail to present to us through these wonderful autobiographies a keen sense of their selves, of their selfhoods, even as their autobiographies can no longer be read as absolutely or historically factual. As I hope I have demonstrated, the, these texts can still, can still yield great profit to the historian, illuminating not only the search 
for selfhood in specific historical contexts, but the dy dynamics of cultural, religious, and ideological change in the Jewish world. And as we move next time back from Russia to the West, first to the autobiography of one of the most famous German writers of the 20th century, Stefan Zweig, and then to that of a contemporary French literary and philosophical theorist, Sarah Kaufman, we will see how the genre of autobiography both changed and then and yet remained the same amidst the chaos of the mid-20th century, the most brutal period in Jewish history. Thank you very much. <laughs>